Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. I've talked in the past about cascading feedbacks. With abrupt climate change, it's like you go in this linear fashion and then suddenly you go in a nonlinear fashion and everything kind of accelerates until you reach a new state. So with cascading feedbacks, it's feedbacks building upon feedbacks, like loss of sea ice, loss of snow cover. Methane is a huge sort of unknown. Uh, mainstream science seems to take the view that methane isn't going to be a problem, but when we go to a completely ice-free Arctic and the temperature skyrockets upward and accelerates, the oceans are warming, the air is warming, the risk of a huge methane burst in the Arctic is increasing significantly. So I'm going to talk about all the nitty-gritty uh, details of methane in the Arctic, um, how it varies on a day-to-day -day basis, etc. I've done some videos recently on methane. Um, this is kind of summarizing them all and giving you additional information. So this report, AMAP assessment, methane as an Arctic climate forcer. So let's get right into it. So Methane is a very strong and powerful greenhouse gas. Um, what this is showing is these are the greenhouse gases. So it's CO2 and the different colors are present day. Well, this is 2010 at the bottom and this is all these IPCC representative concentration pathways. So low emissions to higher and higher emission pathways out to 2100 according to the models. So this is the radiative forcing in watts per meter squared to due to CO2, this is methane, nitrous oxide, ozone, other greenhouse gases. Aerosols give you a negative component because they block some of the sunlight and, and uh, land use changes. Now remember that these models are not accounting for all of the Arctic amplification that is going on and they're not accounting for nonlinear effects. Like they're not accounting for methane feedbacks, for example. Um, it's, more, it's more of a, uh, this is sort of the, 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 the slower linear process, it's not the nonlinear process, but it still is useful. Uh, but we need to keep that in mind. So you can see the different components increasing. CO2 here, you know, going up significantly. Uh, methane doubling, nitrous oxide, in linear increase, ozone increase, um, other gases, uh, you know, not changing too much, and aerosols. The aerosol component decreasing as there's less and less coal burning, etc. Over here is a percentage contribution of the individual forcings to the total. So remember that the global warming potential of these gases is very high, so even though the concentrations is lower than CO2, the effects can be significant. Okay, what this is showing here is this is the temperature anomalies, 1950 to 2012. It's relative to the, here's the mean from 61 to 90 as a, as a um, anchor point or base. And then what you see is you can see the different models, the Hadley model, the GIST model, this is a NOAA model, this is a merged land ocean um, data set. And what you can see is you can see the temperature. Um, this is for the area north of 60 degrees north, okay? So what we're seeing is you can see this rise here in temperature and there's some variation among the data sets. This, the Arctic is warming much faster than the rest of the planet. Um, and that's what we call temp Arctic temperature amplification. This is showing you the different models um, annually in the summer and the winter for the GIST model. You can see that the Hadley model and the NOAA model here, there's a huge gaps in the data. So the GIST model is, uh, is better. This is the annual temperature increase. 
Um, this is the observed Arctic warming, 1950 to 2012, so over 62 years. Um, you can see regions uh, north of 60 here. So what you can see is that most of the warming is coming in the winter, less is coming in the summer, but there is warming in the summer also up in the Arctic. Now these are the scenarios. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, Representative Concentration Pathways. The low emission scenario, winter warming, summer not so much. This is the period 2081 to 2100 relative to the reference period 86 to 2005. But what you can see is, you know, we're warming, we're going on a track at least as high as the RCP 8.5, even higher. So what you can see is this large parts of the Arctic over 11 degrees Celsius projected increase in temperature change here. This is in the winter, this is in the summer. In the summer, there's a lot more warming over the land. And in the winter, it's warming over the whole region. But again, the, 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 the ice is not being modeled properly. So this is, uh, things will be much different from this, but these models give us a handle, um, sort of a baseline to look at. Um, this is showing the near surface air temperature isotherm zero degree Celsius. So this is the, <coughs> um, this is the annual um, air temperature. Um, and what you can see is, you know, in historically 96 to 2005, it's the black line. And as we get more and more warming, there, the zero degree isotherm is moving closer and closer to the North Pole. Um, this is the low emission scenario, the blue line, and this is the higher emission scenario, the red line. So again, the time periods, you know, are very, very dubious and, uh, you know, um, I don't, I don't uh, buy them because we have the, all of these feedbacks that aren't in these models, but this is, so, so take this maybe, you know, in 10 years or 20 years out for this type of stuff, but it shows you the trends um, the trends of the data, okay? Now, the sources of methane. These are the major global sources. These are natural sources. So wetlands dominate 217 uh, teragrams of CH4. Uh, freshwater lakes, pretty high, but uh, geological is, so it's highest is natural wetlands, then geological, then fresh water. So this is uh, from the sediments, methane coming up, lakes and rivers. Wild animals is 15, termites is 11. Wild uh, marine sediments, wild um, term uh, wildfire is three. Uh, permafrost is very, very low here. So they're saying, you know, this is, um, I, the, the permafrost is a big concern. This number can get significantly large. There's huge amounts of carbon um, in the uh, surface layers of the soils, et cetera, stuck in permafrost at the moment that is all thawing. And then anthropogenic sources, we have fossil fuels, we have domesticated animals, ruminants, cows, cattle, et cetera. Um, landfills and waste is significant. Rice cultivation, big factor. Biomass burning, a big factor. You can add all these up, and these numbers are comparable right now. The anthropogenic sources are comparable to the natural sources. The problem is, is as we warm the Arctic like crazy, the natural sources get larger and larger and larger quickly, and um, it's a very strong positive feedback, which causes even more warming in the Arctic. So the big question is, how quickly will these natural sources uh, get larger and larger. And of course, the term natural is a bit of a misnomer uh, because, you know, we, it, we indirectly affect an increase in the natural sources by changing the temperature, by, by the heating. Okay, um, now this is what methane's been doing in the atmosphere, the global average, and it's in parts per billion. You can see a strong increase here, a slowing increase, not too much going on here, and then in 2007, an uptick. 
Now, if you take the slope of that curve, this is what you get. So this is a change in methane um, per year. And what you can see is it slowed down here and it's reached a steady value about five PPB per year increase. Whereas up here, it was, it was uh, faster. So the slope is maximum here. The slope over here is not quite as steep as it was here, which is reflected in the lower level here versus here, okay? Um, that's global average methane concentration, um, okay, from the NOAA air sampling network. Now this is uh, the distribution, the latitudinal distribution of the chain. So instead of plotting that curve of the increasing, this is the PPB parts per billion per year. This is like the increase. So we're looking at basically this curve here, but it's looked spatially um, as a function of latitude, okay, over for the various years. And what you can see is, you know, 2002, large Arctic, large increase in methane from 30 to 90, excuse me, then a drop here, okay, drop of methane for, for those a few, for a year or so here. And then oh, in 2007, here's where we see, you know, you can see the green starting, you know, methane at lots of different places here. And, uh, you know, it stays pretty much green over here. So methane is on the increase. Um, and you can kind of see the regions that it's coming from. So here it was the Arctic, the Antarctica, the equator, two, two bands around sort of the equator. Here, same similar sort of thing. Okay, so you can see the methane uh, increase. Um, now, methane is removed from the atmosphere mostly by the OH minus, tropospheric OH. This is how big the sink is in teragrams of methane per year. So OH minus hydroxide, it takes out methane um, in the troposphere. Tropospheric chlorine, there's some chlorine in the air. Of course, there's chlorine, um, sodium chloride is salt. That chlorine in seawater, um, if, if it dissociates, there's some chlorine above the surface of the water, and that takes out some of the methane. Dry soils, can the, mi the microbes, etc., and some of the dry soils, you know, the methane can go in and, and react on the soils and be broken down. Um, methane gets up to the, methane's light, CH4. Nitrogen is the comp makes up most of the air, N2. Molecular weight of 30. CH4, carbon is a 12, hydrogens are four, that's 16 molecular weight, about uh, just over half the weight of uh, nitrogen. So it rises up, it goes up into the stratosphere and then it's broken down and that produces water in the stratosphere, which you can see in noctilucent clouds. So the total loss, the total loss is 460 to 610, the bulk of that is from the OH minus. And with each of these different processes, you can assign a lifetime. And when you geometrically add those up, you get the lifetime, the total lifetime of, of methane, 8.1 to 10.7 years. And it does depend on the latitude as to the lifetime. Now, if you were to shut down the sources of methane significantly, this is what you'd see in terms of the drop. So this is actually methyl chloroform, which has a similar <coughs> lifetime to methane. And there's production here. And then with uh, agreements, it was phased out. And this is how, how the drop was in the Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere. Okay, so this is what methane would do. This is why we say black carbon and methane are fast acting um, the ways to reduce uh, the, the, uh, to reduce climate change, reduce global warming. If we get rid of black carbon, really cut down the amount, really cut down the amounts of methane, we can have a very rapid response. Um, these are some of the key terminologies, which I will talk about and define. Um, so basically, I'm, uh, this is the first of a series of videos. Have a look at my website, paulbeckwith.net. And uh, thanks for listening.